Hey, before we start the show, I'm always, always excited about VCTV on Friday <laughs> because it's the weekend and happy Friday, happy weekend. So we are just uh, today, I call this the weekend episode of VCTV. Uh, so we're going to have a free flow of discussions, no hard and fast rules. We're going to discuss a new topic today, which is not has not been discussed generally in my panel. Uh, so it's, it's about hospitality, tourism and travel. We have got three great speakers here who already have been on VCTV before, but this is the new topic, so I'm very excited. So it's about, uh, as I rightly said, uh, hospitality, travel and tourism. Um, before I start with the speakers, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sunny Mohanty. I'm the regional director of La Token, uh, I'm based in Singapore, and VCTV is from La Token. So the whole idea about VCTV is to connect investors and founders and startups under one roof um, to come together to collaborate and build something. One of them is building and one of them is helping fund, <laughs> providing that um, um, money, providing advice, you know, so because it's not only the money that is required to build something nice, innovative, it's just the experience as well that comes with that money. So that's the whole idea. So we've got experienced speakers who are investors and been in this industry for like years with lots of experience in variety of fields. So welcome, welcome Gary, welcome Joel and welcome Shrikant, welcome back. Welcome to the uh, weekend episode of VCTV. Shrikant was asking me, do I have some time, Laura? I said, don't worry, don't worry, keep it simple. As Gary says, keep it simple. <laughs> and um, uh, just have a free flow of information and sharing uh, with each other, with our audience. Yes. So great. Uh, I would like to start with Shikan first because Shikan, you know, those of you who don't, do not know you, may not know you, can you please introduce yourself? I am. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, great to be at uh, VCTV again. I am Dr. Shrikant Patasarathi. I am a chartered accountant, chartered management accountant from UK. I hold a PhD in finance from uh, the, the USA. Uh, I'm also a lawyer. I consult uh, uh, top five of the Forbes 100 list in India, and I help manage their assets. I create new asset classes. I manage the existing asset classes. I reject the existing asset classes. And one of the asset classes invariably happens to be uh, hospitality. And uh, um, so uh, I'm here to share those perspectives and uh, looking forward to speaking with um, Joel, Sunny, and Gary as usual. <laughs> yeah, oh, sure. Well, definitely, definitely. Hospitality, I mean, I mean it's a big uh, area that got disrupted in 2020. Okay, next I have Joel. Hi, Joel. Welcome back to VCTV. Did, did we wake you up a bit early? Uh, yes, you did. Monday. Yes, you did. I, it's only because I love you so much that I do this once in a while. Okay, but oh. yeah, yeah, because I'm I'm on the west coast of the U.S. and after this, I'm going back to sleep. So. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, but I'm really honored to know that you love PCTV so much that you are willing to wake up early in the morning, just like Gary and Irina, like other speakers. Uh, uh, once, once in a while, once in a while, Sam. <laughs> Absolutely, girl, I understand that. Uh, and welcome back. Um, so I was Thanks. actually going through your LinkedIn profile and please introduce yourself uh, to the audience that uh, may not know you. Well, uh, I'm Joel Silverstein. I'm based normally in Hong Kong. But uh, since March, I've been on the West Coast of the United States because I was here for a few weeks and then COVID hit badly and the world shut down. And I have a home here in Las Vegas, which is uh, the hospitality capital of the world, I think. And, and so um, I've been here on a golf course with uh, geese and, and ponds and enjoying myself as much as I can. So, But uh, we've been involved in the food and beverage business um, well, I've been involved in the food and beverage business since 1991. Um, East West Hospitality Group, uh, of which I founded in 2008, uh, started out as a, a market uh, entry uh, advisory firm for international hospitality companies. It morphed uh, into private equity advisory back in 2010, primarily. So we've been, uh, we do three things, private equity advisory. We work with uh, portfolio companies and private equity funds, investment companies, and uh, we still do market entry, 
licensing development for hotel and uh, restaurant brands. So uh, we've been in the region, we've been involved in boutique hotels and beach clubs uh, in the, I would say the non-traditional part of hospitality, not the typical five or four star hotel, but the more artsy boutique types of hotels, which are where the trends are going pretty much, you know, uh, certainly in Asia. Absolutely, Asia. I just, on that note, I just wanted to ask, are there no flights open between uh, Las Vegas and Hong Kong? Uh, is it like still? Uh, no, there's, I think there's one flight a week between Los Angeles and Hong Kong and that's it. That's uh, it? <laughs> well, because there's no, uh, yeah. I mean, look, the hospitality industry has been uh, disrupted terribly. Uh, I can't think of a worse industry to be in than being in the lodging or the, you know, the full service restaurant industry today. It's, it's just, I mean, it's a disaster for, for airlines, for hotels, for uh, obviously, unless you're like in Bangkok where every, all the Thais like to go to stay vacations, staycations. Yeah. And actually the hotels in places like Bangkok are pretty full. Right. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a terrible time to be in that industry. Obviously, right. I also uh, saw on LinkedIn that you are the director of Goncha, right? The... Yeah, I'm a board member of uh, several companies, uh, but one yeah. of them is Goncha, which is a leading bubble tea brand. Because we actually in Singapore, uh, and I drink the bubble tea so much, so that's why I could just delay, yeah, you know, so much. Uh, I just wanted to ask you that. Right. We have about I think forty or fifty stores in Singapore, but we have about a thousand five hundred stores globally. But we're very heavily penetrated in Japan, Korea, Philippines, and throughout Asia. So yeah, it's a fun fun job to be a board member of that company because it's still growing even during COVID. COVID, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I people have to drink. People have to drink uh, sunny people have to drink in, in sometimes non-alcoholic. So. Yeah, <laughs> very <laughs> rightly said, uh, Joel, and welcome welcome back to BCT. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, last but not least, Gary, happy Friday. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I How always you doing? wake you up, right? I always wake you up. Am I the al no, alarm? No, 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 no. I, I, I mean, I come on at the last minute because I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm on all day long. My days, I generally have 18 hour days during the week and I do anywhere between uh, uh, two to five speaking engagements every day. So it's right. like all over the world. So just you know, no, I'm up at four o'clock in the morning. So uh, every day. Uh, yeah, pretty much every day. Yeah, every day. Uh, incredible. At four to 11. That's my schedule right now. A little bit of break. Anyhow, uh, my name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur. And this topic, by the way, is very close to me because next Tuesday, I have the former chief security officer, Apple. And I also have one of the top experts on um, illicit trade on my show. And the reason it's really important is because the things we're gonna talk about is things like how to open tourism hospitality through social distancing and some of the AI that can be used. So actually what's one of the topics, I just talked to the former CSO of Apple yesterday, who's a good friend of mine. So it's really important. And so this is really right on target, but I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done 16 companies, two unicorns, um, all right, now I'm stranded in Palm Beach in Florida. Normally I'm in Silicon Valley, but I'm locked down. <laughs> I'm locked down, down here myself. So, uh, you know, we, we are in unprecedented times. And, you know, I was looking at the forecast for hotels at the beginning of the pandemic and then today. I mean, the, the challenge is uh, people are traveling because they're getting uh, sick of being in their places and taking many vacations, if you will you know, weekend yeah. vacations, two or three days. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel and we got to prepare. We can't not get ready for the next uh, couple of years and be locked in our houses. We got to figure out how we can actually use the technology to help us. For instance, yesterday, MIT just developed, uh, I just announced a technology. They can identify coughing using AI right on your phone. They've taken 200,000 training sets and they can tell with 98 plus percent accurate, yeah, if you have COVID. Right, wow. Yesterday, now imagine that. I mean, so there's technology. We just have to use some of the technologies we've got. So I'm I'm really excited about it. The challenge is we're not, we need to though. Yeah, right. For the most part. Thank, not. You. Thank you, Gary, for that introduction. And 
welcome all to VCTV. This is a weekend episode of VCTV because we have two days of rest, Saturday and Sunday. Then I'm back next week on different topics with different speakers. So yeah, so this topic is very close to everybody of here because we all have been disrupted because of uh, not traveling, not socializing, not meeting our family, not meeting our, um, you know, because obviously you are stranded somewhere, somewhere in the globe. Uh, Shrikan, I would like to know, I mean, we know the travel industry um, obviously is the badly hit of the world, of all the industries that we saw uh, or spoken on our panel, but that's related to hospitality, that's related to tourism, no travel, no hotels get affected, tourism gets affected. So I just want to know, uh, know from you, how do you see uh, the economy reco recovering in terms of what, what's, what's the future of this industry? How can we uh, recover out of this crisis in terms of this particular sector? Interesting thought, uh, Sunny. And uh, with respect to uh, the, uh, you know, uh, with due respect to the fellow panelists, I would like to present a view from India which may be hyperbolic in nature and which may be tangential in nature <clears throat> to exhibit uh, how India is kind of coping up with travel, tourism, hospitality, and so on and so forth. Now, here in India, the question of hospitality is basically a two-pronged question where we have restaurants, then you have actual hospitality, right? These are two different. So, so if I may you know, uh, classify that from a typical US sense, there is a mom and pop shop, and then there are these large swanky, uh, you know, five stars, which, which exists. So in India, tourism is basically a $20 billion, or um, uh, hospitality is basically a $20, $20 billion uh, uh, industry. And uh, we saw 50% reduction or 50% closures in the past, I would say five months. Right. right now, this particular closure only led to, um, you know, the restaurants which were uh, already not doing well, kind of closing shop, which didn't have economies of scale and uh, which, which didn't know how to uh, pivot themselves during uh, uh, during this particular uh, crisis kind of shut shop. Restaurants in, you know, involve a lot of capital, a lot of upfront, uh, 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 I would say, capital expenditure to actually run. So they weren't able to recover the money that they, uh, so franchises generally lost money. But what compensated that was uh, uh, almost a 6x uh, uh, growth in delivery platforms, which means the restaurants which used to cater for dine-in uh, you know, uh, uh, patrons kind of catered to dine out, I mean, kind of catered to delivery uh, yeah. patrons. So this resulted in uh, uh, the restaurant focusing on quality. So there was a lot of inward looking that happened in the hospitality sector. Again, in the hospitality sector, I'm just coming, you know, I'm just addressing very closely to the mom and pop shop, the typical restaurants that we, that we see. Now, where does that leave us for the high-end restaurants like, I mean, for the for the five stars like Taj and Marriott's and so on and so forth? Typically, the occupancy rates in India have been hovering in the 50 to 55 percent range, which is a good uh, occupancy as such. Uh, recently, as a matter of fact, I would like to share this. I mean, I didn't share this with you yesterday, Sunny. Yeah. I'm a COVID uh, survivor. I survived oh. COVID. Now, which meant that before COVID, what had happened was I was really getting tired with all the work that I was uh, I was getting, and uh, I I went to an ITC. I you know I stayed there for four days, and I just enjoyed myself, just because nobody was there. It was literally like a ghost town, right? Now the trend that I'm seeing in the hospitality sector is something a term called revenge tourism. Wow, Not what's that? <laughs> is when you're locked down again and again, the right. millennials and the, I'm sorry, uh, lack of a better word, the baby boomers yeah. are kind of getting out and uh, uh, staying in hotels, working out of hotels in spite of having a, light, a, a, a permanent place of residence. They don't want to, they don't want to stay in the same room. I mean, you're in VCTV, you're tired of seeing the same room that I'm in, right? Yeah. Uh, 
millennials kind of want to go out and they have something they are venturing into something called revenge tourism now that again has its own caveats which is you can do a revenge in a local city that you are in or you can perform the act of revenge in a different city right you can move to uh, bombay you can go to singapore and so on and so forth so this is something which is picking up hotel occupancy is now at 75% compared to 50% that they were all which was already a good percentage of occupancy so that kind of uh, paints a very positive picture for hospitality as such and when you paint a good picture for hospitality the allied sectors actually follow you have good good you know tourism tourist places and so on and so forth of course the restrictions exist of course uh, you know you cannot venture out as much as uh, you did earlier Uh, uh i think i think people now are getting out more than ever because they feel that life is too short the, the whole life is too short moment that we had as millennials uh, uh you know has actually come to a true standpoint right now so that is where india stands um it is actually looking good over here i called up a um yeah you know a, a, a married the other day and asked them if uh, you know these these dates are available because i wanted to take my wife and son and they yeah. said they are not available uh, can you try a different date uh, so on and so forth and see it, it has been a very good change right in the, ho- yeah. the the hospitality sector started focusing on what they do best which is hospitality for the lack of a better word hospitality is what it was and it is what it is right now right i mean the the word hospitality has gained the right meaning right now and mm-hmm. occupied uh food is good and everything is good except for the fact that you go to a restaurant right now you you it's literally crowded right so i i don't know if the, it's the same thing all over the world but india i don't know uh indians have a different kind of uh, so you uh, right uh, shrikant in terms of restaurants and i would say i see people like totally like queuing up and there's a long queue especially restaurants i would say in singapore as well there's same same story uh but what about travel but we cannot uh you know tra- we cannot travel like the way we used to travel i mean these industries like restaurants hospitality are obviously getting back to normal you know getting back to normal as you rightly said but what about travel okay uh, so i'm going to present a very very unique uh, point of view over here travel can be thought about in two prongs right one is aggregation platforms like uber ola taxi for sure which used to survive which used to cater to people who didn't want to drive hmm. and now you have a, a, a travel component where people are allowed to travel but you cannot have more than two people in a car and so on and so forth yeah gives rise to that kind of provides a fillip to the production or the manufacturing industry where smaller and smaller cars are being manufactured electric vehicles are being manufactured for example uh, you know there used to be this particular infamous case of uh, a car called uh, nano which could which was a, a you know a modified uh, tuk tuk that we can say as a matter of fact tata tata registered the highest growth of its smallest car not the nano it's like a car called tiago registered the highest sales in this covid period that was primarily because of the fact that people wanted to travel but they wanted to travel in a in a much yeah. so larger cars are are getting out of out of sync that's a different story now travel you asked me a question but what happens to travel what happens so revenge tourism actually kind of provides fillip for the travel as well and provides fillip for long distance travel because people generally want to move away from from places where people other people are there so which means places which were unexplored are being explored uh, so no longer do you find a place in india where uh, nobody will be there and uh, um, you know you can just have some quiet time anywhere you go you'll have you know the other day i was in kaban park which was a, which is my local hot spot yeah. and it was flooded it was a sunday it wasn't a peak time at all and it was flooded there were so many people so the point i'm trying to make over here is uh, travel in some senses has kind of cut down in yeah. some senses, i mean for example flights uh, uh, even flights i wouldn't say i mean i wouldn't say it's actually gone down the number of uh, flights at uh, indigo the local the, the regional flights are doing quite well international international travel is definitely not doing well yeah. but 
intercity or intracity kind of travel kind of uh, is is still doing well places unheard of are being explored which means that which gives rise to the possibility of more fuel being consumed which means that petrol sales are up which means the government coffers are up you know you see the yeah so pivoting so they're pivoting uh, to a different like as you rightly said the domestic with india us europe the domestic flights are still on i agree i live in singapore so i don't know or see that but <laughs> other countries i know for a sure the international flights obviously are not uh, there um and as you rightly said in even in singapore like you know th- th- there is this place called uh, plow bean i've never been there before i've been living here for the last 9 years but now when i go there i see the entire singapore there <laughs> so as you rightly said the unexplored places are getting explored and that's the new bangkok by the way i would say <laughs> Used to do five years back. I used to come over to Singapore, take the uh, take the uh, train out to uh, uh, you know the 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 end stop, and uh, uh, kind of uh, you know walk my way to Johor Bahru because we had set up a plant in Johor Bahru. Nice. So uh, uh, you know uh, those days are coming back. So good. I mean, Dubai opened up, right? People are having conferences. People are the 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 family offices are literally booking. uh uh you know uh, private jets to go to dubai and have conferences there oh wow good thing a good thing for the economy a bad thing for the climate you know i don't condone that at all but private jet booking is actually happening which is i wouldn't have heard of that uh, before yeah, i saw in news like thai airways are just flying uh flights up in the air and they just cover all the religious uh places they just fly and fly in the top but how huh? was that i mean how are you pivoting to satisfy um somebody who is religiously oriented and would like to go and visit in person just by flying up you know in the uh, in the air i really don't understand that but again as you said it's a lot of cost right so but so- uh, one which I, which i want to mention over here what will be affected is um, you know i don't see this as a as a you know as a permanent disruption of course there is a permanent disruption in terms of you know how you travel how the seats of an airline are arranged for example a travel to hajj on an annual basis will still go on travel to religious sites will still go on so it's just a matter of you know instead of going in november probably they'll do it in january so it's just a delay that you are having in these yeah. regions and and trust me i mean people are tired of staying within four uh, walls people are tired of zoom uh, uh, you know uh, totally so, agree so totally agree <laughs> going to, uh, for example yesterday i was speaking to someone who uh, who's from uh, scotland so they've imposed a lockdown over there and he was telling me that look the lockdown is there but still uh, you know what happens is uh, civil liberties have to be protected so if i don't if i have to go out i will go out right, right. so uh, you know that is more important than any other uh, uh, thing as such so uh, you know people you cannot change people you cannot change uh, the the uh, you know the the mental health uh, uh, required to actually go out and seek uh, uh, support right All right, uh, Shrikant. I'll come back to you with more uh, insights. Um, I'll just next up uh, uh, speaker Joel. Hi, Joel. Uh, Hi. I want your I want your insights as well uh, about uh, okay. what do you think. I mean, uh, obviously Shrikant spoke about uh, India, like you know what he sees in India. Uh, mm-hmm. So with respect to the rest of the world, you can cover like you've been li- living in Hong Kong. You've spent a lot of time in Asia last time when you were on a panel. and now you are in las vegas i would love to be there locked down and also florida i don't mind <laughs> now, so what do you see uh, what are the what's the future of right. this industry how are we going to evolve out of this crisis this this particular I, industry i think the best way to answer it is for me to tell you what i'm working on what the investment yeah. clients we have are asking us to work on and that will be as good an answer as you can get number one distressed assets number one distressed assets so um this industry is going to have a lot of corpses all over the place in restaurants and in hotels and there's a lot of money out there that's looking at buying these assets very very cheaply or buying the debt cheaply so that's number 1 so this is not an industry in the next 
12 months that's going to be all that attractive to anybody other than picking over corpses. So my view is a little different than maybe some other people on the panel, but I see where the money's going. The money's going into distressed assets. The second point is the money's going into technology solutions to restaurants, to delivery, to payments and all of that. But, and there's a lot of venture capital money going into all sorts of digital efforts. You know, there, I can't count how many different ordering platforms there are, how many different delivery platforms. And I'm talking about uh, technology support. Right. The problem with all of those is none of them make any money. So they're all losing huge amounts of money. So because of the interest rates globally being close to zero or negative interest rates, you've got enormous amounts of mad money going into all of these platforms, all of which are losing money. Okay, yeah. so you've got generally, uh, del all delivery companies are losing. There isn't one delivery company that's making money on delivery. Okay, right. you have companies in China that have super app platforms that make money because they own the equivalent of payment systems or they own the equivalent of um, things like Yelp in the United States. But generally, the delivery side of the equation is a business doesn't make any money anywhere. The, as I said, the technology solutions don't make money anywhere, okay? And so the, the, that, that's just a fact. One of the interesting initiatives is there are some uh, hotel chains that, of course, they have kitchens which are not being used or being, you know, because of the capacity. So many of them are putting in AI solutions for dark kitchens. So the ones that do, um, you know, in-room dining, right, that yeah. bring food up to the, there's nobody in the rooms in most cases. You know, in Vegas, it's maybe 20% capacity. So almost all the hotel, almost all the restaurants in the hotels are shut with the exception of, of some. So you can get a very cheap um, hotel in Las Vegas at the top hotel, but there's very few people there. Again, right. that, that's just the reality. So I think we have a situation where the best opportunities in hotels and in restaurant groups are more distressed assets than anything else, especially debt. So, I mean, that's what I would say. I mean, so it's not an, it's probably, as I said, one of the worst industries to be in. It, look, look at the airlines, look at Cathay Pacific. You know, they're, they're gonna operate, they're operating like 10% capacity. So if you're, even the domestic uh, airlines in the United States, like Southwest, which is the most efficient, they're probably operating at like 30, 40% capacity. And people are still worried. People do not wanna sit in the middle seat in an airline. Right. So they, they get even in the best, they can operate at two thirds capacity. There's nobody, nobody wants to be in a middle seat. So, as I said, the opportunities that we're looking that people come to us for is how can I buy this hotel cheap? There's a lot of Middle Eastern money that comes to us and say, look, I want to buy these hotels or can I get the can I buy the debt from the banks at 50 cents on a dollar? So this is an opportunity for investment companies with a lot of cash that want to take advantage of struggling businesses and buy them cheap. But it, it, it is a mirage to think that contactless digital platforms make any money. At the moment, they don't. I doubt they ever will. But because, you know, whenever you have interest rates being that low, you've got fool's money running all over the place trying to get yield. You know, whether it's DoorDash or Uber Eats or any of those, I guarantee you they will never make any money. I think Joel, you have a you, you definitely have a point there. If if I'm just putting my investor hat on, I'm just thinking like an investor right now. If I'm a smart investor, I would really put my money in this distressed assets right now. Uh, so I, I, I that's what we recommend, right? We would that's what we're involved in. That's where the money comes to us for. So the only thing we're really interested in is distressed at, uh, buying brands out of bankruptcy, things of that nature. Are what's occupying our time? Great. Thank you so much for making us to think a little differently. Thank you, Joel, for that. It's um, just a reali reality check. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joel. Gary, over to you, please, with the same kind of question. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, look at where we are today. So we've got you know, 31% uh, occupancy rate in the U.S. today. In China, it's 60%, but as, uh, I don't know who said it, Joel? Shrikanth, uh, it's 60% because of domestic travel. So people are getting uh, house happy and they don't want to stay home. Yeah. So we've got, we've got that thing. And at the same time, we've got another possibly two, maybe three years of this particular pandemic based on um, 1918 and the Spanish flu. I mean, we haven't found a cure for uh, AIDS yet, right? We don't have a vaccine for AIDS and it's a virus. So. I would so from 
in terms of, you know, story, keep it simple. So we have two amazing Chinese restaurants, not too far from where I am in Palm Beach. <clears throat> One of the restaurants, uh, I went in there and talked to them right before they closed. They said, we're going to close. We don't want to do anything. The other one, I'd gone in and I knew him too. So I went over and, and I would talk to him. He said, well, we're going to tough it out. We're going to see what happens. Well, he started delivering, right? So he started um, delivery and then he actually started um, uh, having takeout, lots of takeout. His business doubled. So there are some bright lights. The thing is, you can't be afraid. You got to face the challenge. The other thing is, I had said earlier that one of the things that I'm doing is I'm working with some incredible AI technology with uh, computer vision, with uh, thermal imaging cameras, FLIR cameras, HIC vision cameras, to be able to put so you can actually find, if so, look at somebody and see if they have a temperature coming into that particular restaurant or retailer or hotel. And we're actually working with one of the big chains, Joel, in, um, in uh, Las Vegas right now. <clears throat> we also have the ability to look at things like social distancing. So one of them, one of the challenges is, you know, people don't behave. When you put them in a bar, I don't know how it is in Singapore. Well, probably there they behave, but here they don't behave. They get together, they got their arms around each other, a couple of drinks, et cetera. They don't do that. We, behave. we, ha we have to behave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you can't chew gum and that kind of thing, you got <laughs> you got a challenge. But here, no. So one of the things is to be able to enforce and use the technologies that we have the, um, in South Korea, having uh, to be able to, you know, do contact tracing. So the one is to prevent, right? And my daughter had um, COVID, um, friends, many, many of uh, my friends have had COVID. They pulled out, some have had some challenges, but, you know, we're going to get through this. You're right about the private jet travel. That is on the increase because people are afraid and they don't want to go on a uh, plane. It's like, you know, pretty simple. So we've got to, what we have to look for is ways that we can use technology from my perspective, and especially my area's artificial intelligence to be able to make this better. And I think that it's an unprecedented time to be able to use some of those things that we have today. We're coming out of this. People are now, um, you know, when we started this in the, I remember being on VCTV early on yeah. in uh, March timeframe, February, March timeframe, when we just got in the middle of this thing and people were scared to death. Now we're going through the digital transformation. People start to understand how, what it is, how to deal with it, you know, wearing masks. I remember before, Sonny, if you would have told me a year ago, I'd be wearing a black mask and I would <laughs> be going into a restaurant, they'd think, I would say I was going to be robbing the place. There is no way that I would ever think that I would have, a, literally, I have a black mask that or I would me. be going into any place. <laughs> and <laughs> and now, if you don't do it, you get in trouble. We get yeah. fined here, $250 if you're out without a mask on, if you're not exercising, and uh, $750, I believe, at the second offense, right? It's crazy. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's taken society a while. We didn't have masks. We didn't have toilet paper. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. You know, it was all kinds of fear. But we're starting to become a, one thing about humanity is we do adapt and mm -hmm. we adapt very quickly and not always in a good way either. We sometimes we <laughs> let our guard down, but what we have to do is we have to understand that there are ways that we can help move this forward, being safe. And I mean, I don't know about you, me personally, when I would go to McDonald's or some takeout place before. I mean, I didn't always wash my hands before I would go up to the, I grab the drive-in, grab the sandwich, grab the straw, forget about it. Now I got hand sanitizer in the car and I'm like this, oh, here's my money. And I'm doing this when I hold the money, when they bring it out, I do this and I wipe it all over the straw. <laughs> it's yeah. Crazy. So, but those are some of the reality. So I think that, you know, if we look at where we're going with this thing, we looked at you know, the decline in the restaurants, absolutely. But the ones that adapted, the ones that did take out that could are winning. Panda Express, right? Used to only be a dine-in. These are the on the low end of the restaurant uh, chains, but they only bit, were dine-in. But then they opened up for takeout. 
right? A lot more mm-hmm. takeout. And their business was booming because people wanted to get out, didn't want to sit home. So take advantage of the opportunity of what we have. Look at where those uh, technology can be implemented. Don't be afraid. Figure a way around it. Yeah, I just want to tell you something. In Singapore, um, at all the public places, like where you have to queue up for the public uh, buses or the trains, uh, government is provided has provided the hand sanitizer free of cost, like the big box, like everywhere uh, for people to clean their hands on the way. Similarly, in the, in the condominium that we live in, like the private condos, uh, I'm sure the government condos as well, they have provided one in the lift, inside the lift, and outside everywhere, the hand sanitizer. So we don't forget, we see it everywhere. Like not only in the restaurant, but everywhere we go, we see hand sanitizer. So I have to keep on hand sanitizing all the time. So that's why I wanted to just add um, from my experience. Um, so I just want to ask you, Gary, I'll start from Gary and go back to Shrikant. Um, uh, I just want to ask uh, about the budget airways. Like I live in Singapore, I used to travel to Malaysia on Air Asia. You know, so cheap, like, you know, it's like uh, probably a $50 or something from here to there. Uh, and then Thailand also, also on a, um, a Silk Air. So all this budget airways, how are they going to recover? Because they, 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 it's the number game for them because the size of, uh, of their revenue is less. It's the number game. How, how are they going to recover? Are they going to recover at all? I think they need to be flying those family offices around. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you got to think differently. I mean, think about it. They worked on low margins and they did it on volume, right? So, I mean, it's like, I'm not, you know, I'm a country boy from Pennsylvania. So, you know, I grew up (laughs) on the farm. It was, you know, this is pretty simple. You got pigs, you got cows, you know, (laughs) pigs are pigs and cows are cows. So if it was me, I would figure out, First of all, I would look at the routes where I can get the the uh, volume. Uh, what I, they're probably going to have to raise the prices of the ticket, um, and at the same time, I would look at some innovative ways that I can fill those, uh, you know, mo- moderately fill those planes up. Understanding that I may not have the low price, like I had twenty nine dollars or whatever it is, eighty nine dollars uh, round trip but I got to figure out where I can be competitive in the market. I mean, it's, it's a different situation. And by the way, if people understand, if it was me, I would be focusing on the safety and I would not talk about how cheap we are, but how mm-hmm. clean we are. Right. I would focus on something different. I always use that as a branding to get the word out. Right. Got it. Thank you, Gary. And uh, Joel, same question. I mean, coming to budget airways that uh, I used to use, more frequently than anything else, how are they going to recover? Um, they may not. I mean, so, some will, some won't. But I think, look, look domestically, I mean, it, one of the points that was made by one of the panelists, which is correct, is people just get used to things. I mean, I once um, had to be in a very, very small hotel in Japan, a room. I could barely turn around. And it was so depressing to be in one of these very small um, right. rooms. But yeah. after the second day, it, it bothered me less than the immediate shock, right? You kind right. of acclimate to what you have to be with, but but look, the airlines of the airlines are all getting massive subsidies from governments or to survive. So, again, this is another industry. I think Warren Buffett or someone once said that, you know, how do you make a billion dollars in the airline industry? Start with two billion. You know, <laughs> meaning that it's it's generally a terrible industry. It's very high capital intensive. You know, one of the things I want I forgot to mention. Um, Asia, if we talk about Asia versus the US, um, Asians live in, generally, generally speaking, small apartments, high, high density populations, right? Yeah. So you'd go crazy in a one bedroom apartment if you never went out, okay? In the US, I'm, I'm in a you know, 350 square meter home with a golf course next to me. I, I mean, if I never go out, I could care less, right? right. I, uh, I don't even see my wife half the time and she's with me. So, I mean, so <laughs> if you're, if you're in that kind of environment, uh, I'm not getting any house fever fever, but if I'm in Hong Kong, the reason I, I came back is I don't want to be in a one bedroom apartment in Hong Kong yeah. uh, with nowhere to travel. It's depressing. Right. So I, I think it all depends on where you are. And also remember in Hong Kong, Singapore, it, throughout, throughout uh, Southeast I, Asia, there's yeah. almost no, I mean, COVID is under control, right. Yeah, in China, right. 
in yeah. Korea and Japan. It's only the countries where people are more free you know, in, in their minds, you know, want freedom, you know, right? The Europe and the United States and India is a special case <laughs> <laughs> for COVID. But like, you know, but I mean, in those markets, it's a different story because the government's done a poor job of controlling it. And it's a completely different situation than, than Korea, whatever. But what I will tell you one final point, even in Japan, where there's almost no COVID, the yeah. restaurant companies, the hotel companies we're involved in are down 50%. Okay, even when there's no COVID. So people are still extremely leery despite there being no COVID. Some of our clients in Vietnam, where there's, I think, zero COVID, are down yeah. 30, 40%. Okay, in yeah. hotels and restaurants. So it's even the, the perception that it's coming back or just under the surface that stops consumer demand. Right. Thank you, Joel, for your insights uh, on that. Uh, Shrikant, I think from an India perspective, I, I, may, I think you may have a differing or different opinion about the budget airways. I, I have a sense. <clears throat> See, India perspective is different primarily because of the fact that we have always bucked the trend and uh, when the whole world was going under in 2008, it barely, you know, grazed us. Uh, I'm not saying that out of pride, but uh, uh, it is more in the sense of, uh, you know, where the fundamentals lie in India. So um, to understand how budget airlines actually work, you should understand how when they started booming. And if you see around circa 2013, is when they started, um, you know, offering tickets at uh, uh, as low as uh, thirty dollars, forty dollars, and you you have tickets at forty dollars in India, by the way, forty USD, right? Uh, uh, so I think uh, uh, Indigo has Indigo, which is the largest private airline, budget airline in India, just like you have uh, Southwest uh, over there, has made orders of six more airlines. So I track that yeah. as a, yes, six more airlines have been placed uh, as an order with Boeing. And uh, 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 so, so the, the way I track it is I see more of a consolidation happening in India where mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, various companies like SpiceJet, uh, Indigo, and so on and so forth. Uh, so consolidation will happen. Second thing that airline typically uh, uh, relies on is route rationalization. Right. So they'll not fly to a route, that's it. As simple as that. They'll probably fly to, uh, from Bangalore to Mumbai twice rather than doing a Bangalore to Nagpur or Bangalore to uh, you know Jaipur. So uh, route rationalization is what will happen and we have historically seen uh, airlines do that. I don't think uh, there's anything uh, uh, I would say other than that, that airlines could do, already they are negative. I mean, I don't have a differing view on the, on the fact that they're EBITDA negative. Uh, already they are doing negative, uh, uh, you know, they are EBITDA negative. So there's not much to be done except consolidate. Right. Excellent. I think we have covered almost all aspects of the hospitality, including travel, tourism, restaurants, and food, and, you know, sort of, I think the entire, uh, different players that come into a hospitality. As you rightly said, Srikant, hospitality has made, has obviously is giving us the real meaning, like, you know, serving us better. So, but again, as, uh, as always, I hear from the panelists, like crisis always gives us another opportunity, right? So I think this crisis obviously is as bad as it is. Uh, we have lost lives, we have lost a um, lot of other things as well that comes with that. But at the same time, we are very, uh, I think, what I gather from all our speakers, we are very hopeful of a bright future. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, so we have to just stay, um, you know, uh, positive about it. Uh, I just want to know for our closing remarks, do you think a last question, what are your thoughts about, is the travel a tourism industry, travel tourism? I, I think let's just keep aside hospitality, talking about travel, like international travel, is it going to go back to the normal? like 2019 and um, um, till 2019, the kind of travel we saw, like I used to travel almost every week. There were times I was traveling outside of Singapore. Uh, as a closing remark, I would like to know from each of you, what do you think? I mean, we can't predict future, but what do you think is going to be um, the future of international travel? Are, are we going to go back? 
to the same frequency or is it going to be lesser? Joel? Well, first of all, I think that international travel will definitely recover when, there's a, when there are vaccines and the majority of people are vaccinated, you know, and we have proven vaccines, it'll definitely come back. Do I think it'll come back to the same level? It's going to take a long time because I think many companies have realized finally that a lot of work can be done on Zoom, you know, other virtual yeah. conferencing facilities. Uh, I need, in my type of business, I need to travel because I need to walk through hotels. I need to walk through restaurant chains, but a lot of the VCs I deal with on the technology platform are doing due diligence deals virtually. So it all depends on what kind of business it is really, but I would say, yes, it will recover. It won't recover until, you know, there's a vaccine that works and that enough people are vaccinated to feel comfortable, but it will it, eventually, of course, it'll come back and exceed 2019. It's just a matter of population growth and time, but I think it's gonna be a long time. And, and I think a lot less business travel for sure. Yeah. You know, going I, forward, uh, simply because a lot of it isn't necessary. Totally, totally agree, Joel. Uh, thank you, Joel, for that. Uh, also, I'd like to ask, tag on another question to that question. So what's your uh, take about feedback about VCTV? Because I really, we really uh, want to wish to have you back on our forthcoming panels. So just want to take your uh, feedback. No, I think it's fun to be on with intelligent people, uh, for sure, as long as the topic is something I know something about. So I, I, um, you know, I'm happy to participate when I can be available on topics where I have personal experience and are deeply involved in the, you know, in the space. So it's fun to be on and I enjoy meeting other panelists. In fact, I've networked with some of the other panelists I've been on before. So, so it's a pleasure to be on, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Uh, Shrikant, Again, same question to you about the uh, future of international travel, like the business travel will definitely, we think as Joel rightly said, gonna go down, um, but is it going to be back to the normal? I mean, this is a million dollar question, I guess, but uh, just want to know your uh, thoughts about it. <laughs> Every quarter I used to fly to uh, Singapore and uh, Sydney. So this year I did not do that. I think, I think what is going to happen is uh, people who used to have hectic travel are not going to travel anymore. Uh, people who used to travel occasionally are going to travel even more. People who did not travel at all will travel even more just for the sake of it. You know, the revenge kind of uh, will happen. So this will happen as a hockey stick for a few uh, quarters until uh, 2021 ends. And then things will normalize. I agree with Joel in this particular regard. It is bound to increase, but uh, whether it will increase uh, as per the plans that the airlines have, I don't know. So international travel is, I mean, people have realized work can be done more easily uh, through an online mode as such. But, um, you know, there's going to be a surge. I expect a surge coming back once, uh, you know, everything's opened up. Uh, you know, truly opened up and people are, uh, you know, truly open. And then it will again normalize. So the hockey stick will happen and then normalize. So that's something which airlines and travel industry should kind of uh, brace themselves because when that dip happens again, it should not be a COVID kind of dip again. Right. So that's obviously a learning uh, curve for them. Right, Srikant, thank you. I'm sorry, your feedback about VCTV. <laughs> Fantastic as usual. I mean, uh, that requires no feedback at all. I mean, uh, this is a fantastic platform where we discuss something which is quite, quite close to my heart. Uh, I thank the fellow panelists for their inputs. Fantastic as usual. And uh, thank you so much, Shrikan, for always coming on our panels and enriching each of us with your knowledge. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Gary, over to you uh, with the same question and feedback about VCTV. Okay, what question do you want me to... to uh... So Gary, in my opinion, if tomorrow things go back to normal, I wouldn't be sitting before a Zoom. I really don't feel like, because it's too much of Zoom, Zooming, you know, for the last few months. I really go out there. You know, if it requires me to travel to another country, I do that. It's just the way we human beings are wired. Like, you know, if we are forced to do something for a long time, we want to break out of that and just lead a normal life. Because from from childhood, we have been social beings, right? We, we meet people, we gather, um, you know, be it entertainment, be it, uh, um, you know, kind of religious gatherings. 
we always like to come together in person and meet in person and discuss and do business in person. So what do you think uh, when everything goes down, like hypothetically, we have a vaccine uh, and things go back to normal. Do you think everything is going to go back to normal in terms of international travel? Um, no, I don't think so. Because I mean, look at it this way. McKinsey did a study that said 92% of the companies were going through digital transformation about a year ago. It was unprecedented what happened over the last nine months. But at the same time, look at it. There's 400 million active participants on Zoom every day. Uh, I just wrote Eric uh, from Zoom uh, three weeks ago, right? He's worth $19 billion, right? It's, we've changed everything, but think about the other thing. We've really democratized opportunities. Look at where you're reaching right now with us here. We're reaching all over the world. That was not going to happen before. We're now touching people in Vegas and in India, uh, in Singapore. Uh, you know, yesterday, I mean, I can't tell you how many countries every day I talk to. It's incredible. So what we've done is really changed things fundamentally. And then look about it. There's one thing about, you know, Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning years ago. But what I understand the touch points, but think about how much more efficient you are now. Because for you to go to a conference to speak like you're doing right this second would involve all of us and a tremendous, you know, $40,000, you know, with plane tickets and hotels. I mean, you start adding it up, a tremendous amount of money. You can do it like that now. And now people are open to it. You couldn't have the access that you do now on this platform uh, before. How hard was it to get to a CEO of a company before, right? Tomorrow, I have this former CSO of Apple and one of the top guys from the State Department on security. To do that before would be hard. I mean, to uh, really hard because they're really busy. Now they have more time because they're efficient. So I think we will come back to some new normal, but it's gonna be different than before. You know, I do, my company Eva does remote work first management and our, our business is booming. People are now, before it was like, I don't know, I don't wanna have remote employees. Now they understand that that's a, the case. And oh, by the way, it costs them a lot less for the real estate. And people, as much as they complain about it, you know, they're home with their kids. They, their family life has changed. Look, it's, I mean, think of bike sales. You can't get a bike. It's really hard to get a bike because people have gone back to basics. Board <laughs> games, right? I mean, playing board games and things, right? I'm sure you do it with your daughter. And I mean, and so it's like things that were simple that we did 30 years ago, people have now found that they can connect. At one, on one sense, we're using college technology to make our lives more efficient. On the other side, technology made us distant from our families. How right. much more time do you spend with your husband and your family today compared to before? A lot. Yeah. And before you didn't even know, oh, I, I'm leaving. I'll see you. Uh, I'll be home at six. You know, you leave in the morning, but it's different now. So, I mean, we've had to really reach inside our souls uh, during this pandemic and find out who we are and go back to basics. So technology has helped us on one side and to, in terms of our relationships. And it's also helped us because we're not, you know, we're home. And at the same time, we're much, much more efficient. I got to tell you, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm doing 18 hour days and I could have 12, 13 meetings in one day. I had never did that before. Well, yeah, before I think it wouldn't be possible traveling to Singapore, US, Las Vegas, or India in one day. <laughs> well, <laughs> every day. We not unless you're day. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> unless you are a Superman. You rightly said, you know, I mean, there's people something people I need to know about here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what, Gary, I just want to tell you something. Today I had a, um, a, 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 a client who wanted to meet in the town. I was like, Oh my God, let's do Zoom. It's just literally 20 minutes away from my house. <laughs> See? <laughs> See? I mean, I'm getting people say, listen, why don't we have a Zoom meeting after hours? You know, let's talk about business. So we'll each have wine. I'm like, I never heard it. This is kind of weird, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, so this is a Friday and somebody wanted to meet. I said, let's do Zoom because, you know, it's too long, like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, think about, look about this. I mean, during this pandemic, the Himalayas for the first, Sri Kant will know this, for the first time in 30 years, we've been able to see the Himalayas because the, you know, our carbon footprint is going down so much because of the uh, crisis in a positive way. It's given our planet the chance to heal, right? So all the bad things have come out of this. Uh, there's been some good. There's been light at the end of the tunnel. We understand things differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you so much, Srikant, for your time on a Friday evening. I think we all agree to one point that productivity efficiency has gone up a lot. And we are able to now connect with somebody, everyone in every part of the world. I mean, there are no restrictions. Um, so that way we, we, as Gary said, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and I agree to that. Um, so again, I come every day, Monday to Friday. Now VCTV, I host it twice in a day with my co-moderator from for, for one of the sessions. The whole idea is we see a lot of uh, request from the speakers. We see a lot of interest from the audience. I think everybody wants to stay connected, right? Um, I always listen from you guys that yes, it's, it's the best way to stay connected, share knowledge, um, network with, I can still hold my cup of coffee out. Maybe it could be a wine as well after a few, few hours <laughs> and network over, over Zoom. This is how our lives have changed in the last eight months. And this is probably is going to be the new normal sort of uh, life that we're going to lead. Uh, having said that, um, I just wish you all have a relaxed weekend because obviously since we are at home, we are working, we don't realize how much we are working. Gary wakes up at 4 a.m., 4 a.m. and he finishes his day, I don't know when. So we don't realize that we are working around the clock. So I think we can still, we have to cut ourselves from the, from the real work and take our little um, step back and relax. So uh, thank you guys, thank you so much. And for the viewers who want to network and connect with the uh, speakers, uh, because we are getting a lot of interest from the founder community to speak to investors, Gary, Srikant, Joel. You can always find them on LinkedIn, on their LinkedIn handle, or you can always reach out to us. And their profiles are getting featured on our website and you can always click on pitch and you'll be connected with them um, as soon as possible. One of the team members get a request from you. So thank you so much and uh, happy Friday again, happy weekend. And I see, I will see you next week with new, some of the new topics. Until then, stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Have fun. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye. See you Thank next you. week. Bye bye. Bye.